Thanks everyone for coming to this presentation uh, entitled From Pip to Poetry, Python, Many Ways of Packaging and Publishing. Hope you guys enjoy it. Uh, for those who never heard about me, my name is Vinicius, Vinicius Gubiani Ferreira. I work at ASEAN Technologies as a senior software engineer. For most of my career at ASEAN, I've been a Python backend developer. And since last year, I started working in the newly created quality assurance area of the company. Uh, I'm also an open source contributor. I work on translating the Python documentation for Brazilian Portuguese. And I also love craft beer and riding a shared bike around the park. So our agenda for today in this presentation, uh, we're going to quickly go into the motivation for doing it. We're going to talk, of course, about package managers, PIP, PPM, poetry, everything related and between them. I'm going to show you a dummy application that we're going to package and deploy with each of the package managers. And we're going to wrap it up by showing the differences, the weak and strong points side by side on the three package managers. And uh, hope you guys like it. So let's do it. First things first, uh, the motivation for this presentation is to help everybody who's watching to reach for the next level. Even when we are experienced programmers, there's always something new to learn or something that can be improved. I know I learned a lot uh, during the research for this presentation because last time I tried to package a Python application many, many months ago, it was a total shame, disgrace, to be honest. And uh, this time I felt, wait, that's it. There's something wrong. Can't be that easy. And uh, it is. Uh, and uh, I hope you guys learned something new, even if uh, it's a tiny thing by the end of this presentation. If you did, then I already be glad. So package managers. They are a small but very important part of software engineering, which is called configuration management. And uh, configuration management, for those who never heard about it, is a system engineering process for establishing consistency of a product's attribute through its lifetime. So let's focus on consistency over here. And uh, that means in simple terms or representation that if we add the same ingredients and follow the same process, we will have the same result because after all, everybody had or will have that works on my machine problem, right? So we have package managers to help us keep track of the ingredients, uh, aka the packets that are used on our application and uh, in which version they are actually running. And the quick disclaimer before we're getting to our first package manager, there's more in Python than just PIP. PPM and poetry. There's also there's also easy install, which is now deprecated but served the Python community very well until 2008 when it was replaced by PIP officially. There's also Conda, which is an amazing package manager for the data community around Python and R. There are also the package managers of the operating system itself that can allow you to install Python packages. But they are not usually the best choice because sometimes the version that you have available is a bit outdated. But we're not going to go into details of all of this. So speaking about PIP, to get it started, what exactly does PIP mean? It can actually mean several things like PIP install packets, PIP install Python, and even preferred installer programmer. And, uh, PIP is, is, despite its age, is very widely used in the Python community. And sometimes it already comes pre-installed on some Python systems. And uh, in just in case it's not already installed, you can just CRL this address and run it against the Python interpreter. And that's about it. It will be installed. If you want to install a specific Python package, we just run pip install in the package name. If we want a specific package version, then we just use the double equals and the number of the package. And finally, if we decide to create a manifest of all the packages that we are actually using on our application, then we're just going to create a simple TXT file, store that information in there, 
and use the minus R option to install it. So that's about it with PIP. And uh, some people might be thinking uh, so simple as that, and it's perfect. And turns out it's not, because I'm going to tell you a story that happened with me. It is a true story. And uh, following EuroPython's guidelines, since this is a family conference, this is rated E for everyone. But uh, it's rated only by me, not any other group of people and so ever. So that story uh, starts with a much less experienced Vinicius about nine, 10 years ago. And he was saying, thank God this research project is finally being delivered. I had enough of it. And uh, uh, it just started to break from the previous night to the next morning. And uh, we didn't still understand what was going on. Uh, it was working fine on the previous night. And uh, really, at least I really felt like uh, banging my head against the wall and uh, trying to find a dark corner so I could cry alone. And after a couple of hours minutes of being sad, we started to look it up and to understanding what was going on. And uh, we noticed that a Python package was breaking because one of the dependencies, a child dependence of a package, just flip it from beta version to release version, release candidate, sorry. And uh, that started to break the project build, which took about hours. And uh, after a few attempts, we had to do two minor fixes, which is deciding to manually install the previous Python version of that child dependency that was actually working. But unfortunately, it wasn't enough. We had to install it before the package that we are actually installing. So we're kind of tricking PIP into using the version that worked. And uh, from that day on, we learned some interesting lessons with Python, with PIP. And the first of all is package order does matter, at least in requirements.txt it does. Uh, dependency sometimes is not solved like we think it does, but uh, maybe that is because the computer do what we tell it to do and not what we're actually expecting it would do. Works on my machine is a real thing, and that is very possible to happen with PIP. And uh, there are only two approaches for using PIP. You can either just keep track of the top layer level package that you are actually interested, that uh, you know there are there they have a good use on your project, or you can just keep track of everything like the image on the right, but then your requirements.txt becomes a big mess. And the both of the both of these approaches are not quite perfect. So after going through PIP, some people tend to look to other tools uh, when they are see for package managers, and then they eventually find PPM. And how exactly does it differ from PIP? It takes ideas from uh, many other tools, other package managers like Composer, NPM, Cargo, Yarn, and others. And uh, it already creates the virtual environments automatically for you. And some people might be thinking, what exactly is a virtual environment? Because I didn't mention it before. It's like a tiny sandbox where you install your project dependencies so they don't get mixed among different uh, projects and your operating system packages, which is good because then you don't rely on sudo or root or anything else. Don't expose yourself to security vulnerabilities. It also introduces the concept of pip file and pip file.lock. Uh, and basically, PIP file is the equivalent of requirements.txt, but uh, with a slightly different syntax. It's not just plain text. It keeps track of your top level packages. And PIP file.lock keeps track of the lower dependencies, the ones that you, you're not actually interested. And uh, it's doing so, but uh, just taking note of this package, uh, the release of that package, the link between them, and using hashes everywhere. And uh, is that it? Uh, turns out, no, PPM also have some interesting features that we're going to discuss in a couple of more minutes. And uh, beyond uh, PPM, some people eventually stumble onto poetry. 
the how does it different? Uh, it goes beyond. It also uses the same concept of two files for managing dependencies, but uh, this time they are called the pyproject.to and the poetry.lock, but uh, with the same ideas, pyproject.toml is a human readable file, while poetry.lock, not so much on the other hand, you should definitely try to avoid editing this file by hand. And uh, with poetry, it really feels like you're actually managing a project and not just a piece of code, like when you do with PIP or PPN. Mostly because poetry has some interesting comments that help you out, like maybe poetry neat and poetry new project name. And uh, it really feels like you can control everything with a single tool, including publishing and packaging, which you're gonna see in a couple of more minutes. Uh, but I should probably warn that uh, Poetry is dropping Python 2 support soon. I'm not exactly sure when, but I saw it on their website. But uh, if you're thinking of starting a new project with Python 2, then you're probably in the wrong presentation. You should be watching a presentation maybe about migrating from Python 2 to Python 3 and not a presentation about package managers. All right, so after looking up into our package managers, I'm going to present a, a simple application that uh, we're going to package and publish with each one of them. And uh, this application is not going to make us a billion dollars or uh, maybe save some lives or anything like that, but it's just for fun. We're going to create the Should We Deploy Today CLI application with uh, the package name included, like Deploy Today Pip, Deploy Today Poetry, and that's it. And uh, I'm not the owner of this website myself. I just find it really interesting. It's uh, good for laughing because we every now and then we always need a joke, a laugh to make us happier. And uh, it has a simple API, very simple. It doesn't require any authentication or authorization. So you just get a, get a response from the web and the get message, and that's it. Simple as that. You get different messages according to the day of the week that you are and the time of the day. So getting started with PIP to package and distribute, we're gonna start by creating a simple folder structure like this one on the right. We got our license, a readme, pyproject.dem, different configurations, a source folder, which we're gonna create a module and set our code and a test folder. We're not going to write tests for this simple since this is a dummy application, but uh, uh, just in case you decide on an interesting project, that's nice to have, right? To think about it. And uh, here's the code that we're actually going to use. We're just going to set it up into the source folder on the Dunder main file. Is just getting the get method from the request library and get the API convert it to JSON and just get a specific key and uh, set it up, uh, print it on the screen on the standard output. We're gonna, of course, need to get our uh, request library into the requirements.txt. So over here, we install a fixed version. And if it was successfully, we just take it to our manifest file, the requirements.txt. We're gonna configure pyproject.toml to say that uh, we're gonna use setup to build the package, setup tools. And we're gonna go through a lot of configuration. This is probably the worst slide this time presentation, so bear with me over here. We're gonna set the package name, what's our name or email, uh, some descriptions, the version. The configuration that I'm mostly interested in are the one on the right part which are gonna say where the package should actually be packaged, which is the source folder. And the install requires, we're gonna say that we need the request library. And uh, under the console scripts, we're gonna say, how should we actually call our client and line application? We're gonna say deploy today P, and it's gonna be loaded from the module, uh, example package, the file main and the Dunder main method. So to generate the distribution, we're just going to use the build module that is available uh, with Python. And uh, after we tell it to build our application, we're going to notice that a new folder will come up, which is called a dist folder stand for distribution. 
And inside it, there will be two files, the wheel and the tar -GZ. It, They might come up into in the, on the internet, such as BDIST and SDIST, stands for binary distribution and source distribution. The binary distribution is actually your package compiled to your operating system and your architecture. And uh, preferably, if uh, uh, Wheels Pippin tries to install, if it is available for your operating system and your architecture, because it's quicker. If it's not, then it will install from the source directly, your targz, which is just your sort code zip it. And after we build it, we're going to need to create a token on pyp.org, which is the Python package repository. And uh, I'm actually using test pyp, which is like a, a staging area where you can upload your packets because if you try to do it on production like pyp.org directly, and there are any people using our package, and if you insert a bug, break your package, then you're, make, you're gonna make users uh, kind of mad at you. So preferably, always try to use test by p.org. And uh, after we grab the token, we just configure it on this specific file, set the username to Thunder token and place our token. And uh, we're gonna upload it to PyP with a package called Twine. Just say that we actually want to use the test PyP repository and not the official PyP. Takes a couple of seconds to sign in. And after that, we'll notice that both the wheels and the TARGZ will be uploaded. And uh, we're going to install it from PyP. Just use a different source than the official PyP. Use the minus I option. And now uh, we have uh, our command line application ready, deploy today PIP. If we call it, we get a suggestion that uh, we should not deploy today. Since I was doing these slides on a Saturday night, he mentioned uh, that I should not actually try to deploy it. All right, so uh, going for PPM, uh, how does it different? We have the same folder structure, and uh, we just install PPM and uh, create a virtual environment and install the request library. If we install the request library, PPM already added for PIP file itself for us. You can see in the middle that request, the request library was already added. And the uh, pip file.lock, I'm not going to show it over here because I couldn't fit properly into the slide. But trust me, you open over there, it'll be a big mess full with hashes. So don't change pip file.lock. And uh, to see dependencies with ppm, an interesting feature that it has, you can actually see the graph dependencies like uh, which package depend on which package, and this is very, very helpful in case you have any issues with packages, and works both ways, either from top to bottom or bottom up. And uh, some other features, interesting features that are available with PPM, we can actually check for security vulnerabilities and compliance with PEPs, uh, install packets just as developer packets, and once we're actually satisfied, we just run ppm.lock and it will update uh, pipfile.lock if necessary. And from now on, you actually achieve a true consistency. And uh, if you just run ppm install dash dash ignore pip file, then it will use the dot lock file and it will work for sure. And uh, as I mentioned before, we can actually uh, already install any developer uh, packages by just using the dash dash dev option. So what about packaging and publishing with PPM? Uh, on my research, at least I found that it was pretty much the same process or maybe even a bit more complicated than PIP itself. So that's why I'm going to skip it and go into point uh, and also make it fit into a 30 minute presentation. We're almost up. And uh, with poetry, it already creates the project folder structure for us uh, with a simple command, as we can see on the right. It's a slightly different, but uh, it still works fine. And uh, we add the request package. It uh, takes a couple of more seconds. And after that, it is already added to pyproject.toml and poetry.lock. We don't have to worry about anything else. 
Our source code uh, is pretty much the same as before, just under a different uh, folder. Under pyproject.ml, we have to actually say that uh, the client line application that we actually want, we change the name in the source where it will load a specific Python code. This is where it gets starts to get interesting. Uh, to distribute, we don't actually need any other tools. We just run point reboot. It takes a couple of seconds, and uh, it will build the source distribution and the binary distribution just as before. Uh, we have to also set the token and the PyTest, uh, the test repository for PyP.org. And we can do it with these simple commands. Uploading to PyP is just a matter of saying poetry publish. Also, doesn't need any specific tools. A couple of seconds later, it is already uploaded. And uh, if we install it from PyP test, just run this specific uh, command with P. And we got a new application or a common line, which will be deployed to the poetry. If we run it, we got another suggestion for if we should deploy it today. And since this was on business hours, I believe it was uh, all start of the evening on Tuesday or Wednesday, then we got a message, this is the way, which is a quote from the Mandalorian. It's very Yoda-like, very positive. And uh, with poetry, that's about it. And finally, to wrap it up, as I mentioned before, a side-by-side -side comparison of each of the tools. Uh, my suggestion is that if you're just starting with Python, then preferably just try PIP because it's probably the simplest of all the tools that you can get, but uh, it's not self-sufficient. You will rely eventually on other tools and clients for virtual environments or packaging and publishing. Uh, as you can see, Poetry, is probably the most advanced tool of the three because you don't rely it, uh, even for packaging and publishing. And uh, once again, you should probably uh, stay away from Python 2. Just a reminder, this is not the purpose of this presentation, but uh, it's worth remembering. And uh, yeah, that's about it. Uh, here are the sources that I used for my presentation in case uh, you want to check it out later for more details that were, they were very helpful for me. I would like you to thank you so much for the EuroPython committee and for everybody who has joined me for this presentation. I hope you guys enjoy it. Thank you. Obrigado. Muchas gracias. Vielen Dank. Arigato. Shichue. And uh, I'm still working on the Russian. I can't pronounce it. If you have any questions at all, uh, feel free to contact me into any of these things or Venulins or Discord, any of the ones that are available in the Repartum uh, during the conference. You can also ask questions or doubts. I love to hear your feedback. Thank you so much. Thank you very much for your talk. And let's have your applause. We do have time for some questions. Do you mind some questions? No, not at all. OK, Just we have a microphone here crazy. in front. Uh, could you please get up to the microphone and ask your question? Thank you. Just don't touch the microphone, just go down and ask into it. Thank you. So, thank you for the presentation. Uh, so you mentioned a number okay. of uh, uh, package um, tooling. So I was wondering between uh, advanced ones like Poetry, Conda, Mamba, do you have a view on the trajectory? Like what do, do people use more? Uh, poetry is Conda uh, being phased um, out? Is Mamba still? Um, Conda, I'm not so sure about Conda, but I'm pretty much sure that Conda is very used for anybody that uh, uses, for example, Anaconda, which is a way of distributing Python, which is more focused on the data community, like data analysis, data science, and other. I myself, I'm a web developer, so usually I don't deal with Conda or Anaconda, but I know it exists. For those with that deals with data on a daily basis, I believe they are more focusing on using code themselves. And uh, I noticed during my research for getting the examples that uh, people, it's maybe at least in my opinion, losing a bit of momentum and uh, more modern tools are taking places uh, like uh, even PPM is a bit on decline. Uh, uh, this, the, my opinion, I believe that uh, beginners tend to go uh, by using PIP, and uh, 
intermediate to advanced or Python users are more going with poetry, I believe, in my opinion. Okay, thanks for your answer. Are there any more questions? Please get to the microphone. Thank you. Um, you've talked about poetry, and uh, but there was an issue I encountered when um, I was developing with poetry recently. Basically, I had a dependency, um, but when I installed it, I had an issue. And so searching the issue online, I fell on a GitHub issue, which mentioned that the package uh, required poetry to be like in a preview version. So I had to build poetry from Git sources to actually add the dependency, which was quite weird. So I don't know if you ever encountered issues like this with poetry or... Yeah, I, I'm actually new to poetry. I'm just starting to use it. And I never saw something like that, to be honest, like uh, to install a specific version, a version of a package, uh, you actually have to update your package manager. That sounds a bit weird, but... Uh, uh, maybe uh, I can. To be honest, I'm not sure what could be causing that. Uh, maybe the version of poetry that you installed was some weeks or months ago. That in that case, it caused the issue. That might be it. Uh, I, if you remember uh, when you installed it, that might be the specific reason. Poetry is under uh, constant development. So uh, since it was new, something might have been break, broken during the development. That might be the reason, I believe. But uh, usually package managers don't, that don't have that ever happen, I believe. But uh, I'm so sorry that you had that awful experience. Okay, thank you very much. That's about all the time we have for questions at this point. Uh, so let's have another round of applause for Vinicius for this great talk.